Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Um, I wanted to thank everyone here for coming out to our panel discussion for My Silences Had Not Protected Me. Um, my name is Emma. I'm the programs manager at Four Freedoms, and this is my co curator, Lucy. And before we get started, just wanted to introduce a little bit about what Four Freedoms is and how we've put on this show. So, Four Freedoms is a, a platform for artists and arts institutions to get further involved in the political process, and we're so honored to have had the opportunity to collaborate with Fort Gansmore, who have been such amazing and inspirational and helpful partners in our past like year journey at Four Freedoms. Um, but Lucy's going to talk a little bit more about how we set up this show. Yeah, so the show it consists of 24 women artists, two of which are with us here today, Amy Wilson and Natalie Frank. And it's a really wide range of mediums and approaches to this subject matter of gender, sexuality, and womanhood. Um, there's also a large range of identities, backgrounds, and Attraction, photography, everything. Um, me and Emma put this together in a very organic way where we started with a lot of Fort Freedoms artists and then kind of branched out from there. Yeah, so about that kind of freeform way, For Freedoms really does seek to be this platform to allow for artists to speak um, and to help them raise voices. and. So rather than Lucy and I, when we came up with the theme that we wanted to touch on issues of gender, that we wanted to touch on kind of the dynamics between power and sexuality, rather than us kind of mold a narrative around which this show could you know, revolve, we decided instead to kind of look at a really broad swath of women and femme identifying folks who are talking about these issues. And we took pieces that really interested us, that whose messages were complicated and came from different perspectives and really challenged us to see our own femininity and our own kind of experience in these uh, in these bodies differently. Um, so it's really, really exciting to bring together this amazing group of panelists today. Um, our exhibition is called My Silence Has Not Protected Me, and it's a quote taken from an Audre Lorde essay called Transforming Silence into Language in Action. Um, and in this essay, Lorde has been given a diagnosis, which was false, but she was given a diagnosis that she was going to be, she was terminally ill, she was going to die in three months. And in this essay, she's contemplating things about her mortality and about her experience as a woman and things that have and have not served her. Um, and one of the things she talks about is not only have, my, have her silences about the abuse and trauma and you know patriarchy that she has faced not served her, but that our silences between each other as, as women really haven't served each other or served our greater sisterhood. Um, and really what we want to do with this exhibition, with this panel, is just hear from these amazing different creatives who come from so many different backgrounds and, and practices. Um, we have, you know, curators, teachers, artists, performers, directors, dancers. Like, this is just an amazing group of women that we're really excited to hear talk about kind of these general themes that we all live with. Um, something we wanted to highlight is, though our struggles very often look very different, they really do stem from this similar or same capitalist patriarchy that we all experience every day. And how can we find strength in learning and listening to each other? Um, so with that, I kind of want to ask each panelist to give a very brief introduction, about three minutes, of who they are, um, what they do for their work in their many different interweaving practices, often with a lot of these women, um, and also, how they broadly see this, uh, their work kind of tying into the themes of this exhibition, whether overtly or just in terms of their lived experience. So, let's start with Ogemdi. Hi, everyone. My name is Ogemdi Uday, and I am a dance maker, a director, and facilitator. I, how can I start in <laughs> describing my work? I'm still figuring out my practice, as we all are every day. Um, 
I love to make work collaboratively, oftentimes in large communities, as I do in my theater making practice. Um, and in my dance making practice, I love to collaborate with individuals to really exercise whatever they need in themselves. And so a lot of the somatic work that I do focuses on trauma processing and memory. I'm invested in folks of the black diaspora and I open it up to the black diaspora to say all black identifying folks, um, I'm from the African diaspora as a Nigerian woman. Um, I, in that work that I do, I'm very invested in how memory etches itself in the body and how through improvisation and through reacting to scores and spaces we can begin to restitch the stories that brought us into our bodies and then begin to kind of parse them out and put rearrange them in a way that f creates opportunities for new futures. Um, I also work in a lot of public programming type work. I work at the public theater in their public works department. I'm saying public so many times. <laughs> um, but in that capacity, I, yeah, I, I guess you could say that my work is invested in performance becoming a tool for black and brown folks liberation, for black and brown folks healing, um, and I'm especially concerned with black femmes and black queer femmes. Jasmine? Cool. Um, I'm Jasmine Wahi. I'm the founder and co-director of Project for Empty Space, um, which is currently in Newark, New Jersey, um, and we have a studio program which offers subsidized studios to artists and creatives um, as well as two different residency programs and a gallery that's dedicated to cultivating conversations through contemporary art about social discourse and social activism um, and I'm also a professor at the School of Visual Arts um, in the MFA Fine Arts Department where I teach a variety of things <laughs> um, including a course on intersectional feminism and art making practice. Um, what else do I do? And I curate shows all over the place, mostly dealing with intersectionality um, and multi-positional identities and how we can both empower artists and communities through sort of shared discourse around social activism. Um, and I'm sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so I'm in a, on a different planet right now. <laughs> um, I'm Natalie Frank, I'm a painter, and um, <clears throat> I guess the past five, six years, I've been working, I started working with um, fairy tales, which began as women's oral stories. And I was interested in the way that this type of literature could be a place where women express their desires, fears, anxieties, a place to be liberated um, when the church and state were cracking down on their freedom of speech. Um, of course, men took these fairy tales and shaped them and revised them for poetics, such as the Brothers Grimm, um, but, but all of these stories began as women's oral tales. So I started this work um, kind of on the advice of a mentor of mine, an artist who's worked a lot with fairy tales and figurative artists and um, began with the Brothers Grimm and looked at the unsanitized tales from the 19th century um, and had the chance to make a book for an exhibition and fell in love with bookmaking and publishing books and um, continued to collaborate with the fairy tales scholar um, who I worked with on that, whose name is Jack Sipes. And, um, years ago did the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which, which traced the tale type of the Sorcerer's Apprentice through 2,000 years of literature. Um, in an interesting twist, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which you may know as the Disney version of Fantasia, began with all female characters, but after Christianity, the idea of women shape-shifting became too threatening. So all of the women were excised from the stories, except for one woman at the end who comes in as the love interest and were replaced by men. And so he translated tales from 2,000 years of literature from many languages, from Ovid to Herman Hesse, and I did the drawings for that. Um, the next book I did looked at the story of O, the erotic novel from 1954, 
the sort of icon of sex positive freedom that Susan Sontag wrote beautifully about um, and used it to define the differences between art and pornography. And I can talk more about that later, but a drawing from that exhibition is behind us um, here in the, in the show. And looking forward, I'm working on a third book with Jack Sipes of the first feminist fairy teller in history named um, Baroness Kathleen Delmois from the 17th century. And it, this, because she's a woman, um, she's never had a book devoted to her. Her tales have never been collected, nor have they been illustrated. So this will be the first volume. She actually invented the word fairy tale. And she wrote wonderful stories such as Finette Cendron, which is Cinderella. Um, but in her version, the princess agrees to marry the prince, but says, before I do so, I want to stand up before the whole kingdom and tell my oral history. So they're archly feminist stories. There are a lot of fairies in them who, at the time, were in charge of um, female reproduction. So there, it's kind of ripe with symbolism and feminism. Um, and that'll be a large kind of 400 page illustrated book with drawings that are this size um, with a couple hundred pages of marginalia. And then I'm also working on um, a ballet with the Brothers Grimm work that I did is being made into a ballet with Ballet Austin. And so I'm designing sets, costumes, textiles, and animations. <laughs> and it opens in March. Um, so that is what I'm doing. And yeah, it's, it's, it's been, just say that it's for 10 plus years I painted and didn't draw and um, I began to follow kind of my heart in a way and started drawing and now I'm only drawing and working collaboratively um, not painting on canvas and I have never been happier so <laughs> um, I, I'm Anastasia Lauren uh, I'm an artist and organizer and writer um, and so I mainly make performative video work and um, writing. And so for me, um, my practice is really process-based and is essentially trying to get at this idea of decolonizing experience and institutions by centralizing experience and spaces. Um, and so for that, for me, that means um, finding some sort of um, erotic revolt within this body movement and work that I'm making that explores the relationship between uh, my identity as a black woman um, and that being rooted in this dissonance of identity that's first an object fighting for some sort of personhood. Um, and yeah, I am participating in an artist residency in Leipzig in January while we make more work and rolling around in play, and that's mainly what my practice consists of. Um, so I'm excited to explore that. Uh, I'm Amy Wilson. Uh, I'm the artist, I think Bethany's right over there, um, which is made entirely out of thread. Uh, so I'm an artist and I teach at the School of Visual Arts in the Visual and Critical Studies BFA program. Um, and I've been there for about 15 years now. I think. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I'm also, I'm trying to think about the best way to describe it, like, a lot of people say activist, I think more of a rabble rouser, candy ass kind of person um, in Jersey City, trying to work to keep whatever little tiny bit of Jersey City we can still keep to be livable for working class and poor people. Um, and so I'm very involved in uh, organizing around the public school system and, and things like that. Um, sort of holding on to information. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's enough for me. I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's all conventional. Great. Um, so we'll start off the conversation with an open ended question. But when did you first experience the feeling of being sexualized or objectified? <laughs> I, I have a very clear memory. I grew up in New York City and in New Jersey, so we're splitting my time, and I remember very clearly walking down uh, 6th Avenue in the West Village and uh, walking by, I had to be like 10 years old, and some creepy man saying something to me. And for whatever reason at that moment, that's 
I don't know if that was the first time ever or what, you know, but for me that was like a <coughs> moment that like I wasn't necessarily just safe just walking down the street. And I think sort of um, pairing that feeling of being unsafe and that feeling of being objectified together, that they sort of necessarily went together, I mean, that's to me um, something that really strikes me. Um, and I remember my mother being there, um, and I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too into my relationship with my mother, but um, she, she just, she thought it was, it was great. She was like, this is great, like, those guys think you're pretty, and isn't that wonderful? And I was just like, this is the most gross, horrible thing, blah, like, I was so grossed out by it. Um, and then, you know, thinking a lot about the feeling, that, you know, my takeaway from it versus, like, her version of it has been something that I can kind of come back to many times. Hmm. I feel like I have a really specific moment about remembering, like, which makes you raise your voice oh, just so because sure. we have those stuff upstairs. <coughs> um, I remember a really specific moment of um, having a conversation with my mother as well that was uh, about posture and about sitting specifically, and you know, not to sit with my legs open, but I can sit with my legs open. And so, that being kind of the first moment of, okay, why am I limited in this way, and like, what does it mean, et cetera. Um, as well as like my experience as like a teen being this thing prefaced by violence and warning, basically, of, you know, Yeah, yeah, just like kind of um, being introduced into my own like freedom and autonomy by be careful with how much luxury you take in that because there are so many things against you um, and you're vulnerable immediately just inherently by being a woman you are vulnerable. I want to speak to that term you brought up of luxury. Um, I, I find the question to be quite interesting because I believe that I didn't realize I was sexualized until I was 20. And that strikes people as very old, but in some strange way, I think that being sexualized was almost a luxury of being a woman in a lot of ways. And I didn't see myself a woman, I saw myself a black thing. And so I remember the first time that I really checked in with the fact that people were perceiving me as a sexual object was when I was actually on a trip in college um, in Greece and in some strange like irony I was walking through a meat market and I was walking through a meat market by myself like in my like in a shirt that I wear all the time just like a little button down and like my little like as my mom calls them like don't wear your daisy dukes and like my little daisy dukes and walking through this um, meat market with my headphones in and my sunglasses on, kind of how I'm always walking around, and I just remember hearing this roar and getting really confused at why I'm like, what is, I'm like, is this my music? And then taking my headphones out and just realizing that like all these men were yelling at me and just like yelling at me and trying to grab me and yelling things that were a mixture of like sexy and like kind of like saying black in Greece in Greek and all these things and so kind of that weird meshing of things in which I was just like okay so am I black thing or am I sexy and like which one should I hold on to should I be scared because I'm a black thing or should I be complimented because I'm sexy and so I think it's this really strange thing in which like we talk about this idea of sisterhood but I felt like understanding the feeling of being objectified was a luxury of sisterhood and I did not have the luxury of feminine sisterhood because I was not yet female. And so trying to figure out like how, okay, well now I know, now I see that like, I can look back on all those other times in my life and recognize that that was me being sexualized. But I felt like it was very distinctly strange because that was also the same time when I was realizing I could go out with boys, I could have sex with people, I could do what I wanted. And so it was this weird like, okay, so 
Is it the trauma of realizing that you are a sexual object as a woman? Or is it this exciting awakening of realizing that you have a body that people perceive as a sexual body? I was, I think, 12 when I started nude figure drawing from life. Um, and this is a horrible story, which I tell often to shame the school. But um, I, my mother took me, because I was young, to this woman's garage. And of course, I grew up in Texas, so anything new wasn't happening. Even in leotards, that wouldn't happen because it was too tight. So my mom took me to this woman's garage. All these you know, post-menopausal women sat around, and we would draw the, the model. And I was always the youngest person in the room. And um, I didn't think anything of, you know, the man who put his penis four inches from my face. So to me, it was anatomy. And I, I wasn't aware of sexuality at all, 12, 13. And then I started to take the drawings to my um, high school. The head of my high school as a man, um, saw them, tried to kick me out of school for to be a, as a pornographer, waged a campaign throughout my high school years to have me kicked out. They kept me out of the honor society. They, um, so, and then he said, after I got into college, and they were proud of that I got into college early, so they said, you can do nude women and nude self-portraits, but no nude men. <laughs> because that will, um, they thought, scandalize the young children who could walk through the hallways of the art program. Meanwhile, I wasn't setting up a nude man in the hallways. I was just bringing the drawings into the art room. Um, so that was the first time I thought, wow, someone in a position of power who is a man is telling me what I can and cannot do and sexualizing me and insulting and humiliating me in the process. And kind of to take it back to For Freedoms, um, Zoe Buckman and who's in the exhibition as well, we recently did a mural that started at Live Arts, it's a wall vinyl of quotes from politicians from the past 15, 20 years they've said about women and their bodies. And it started at Live Arts and now it's at um, the Corcoran, thanks to For Freedoms. It's both in the rotunda at about 30 feet and also on a billboard across from the White House. Directly oh, wow. facing the White House. That's yes, right. including <laughs> quotes from Trump like and that. Pence and some Democrats thrown in, but more like, I'm LBJ, move over, I'm your president, not, you know, women have no control over their bodies. So um, that's, that's where it began for me. And it's interesting that it's continued steadily throughout my life. And that's probably one reason I, I got into the I, whatever I'm, the narratives I'm telling, that's probably one, one very strong reason that I ended up there. Yeah, so I guess that leaves me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my relationship between my realization of being a sexual object and my realization of being brown kind of intersected with each other and, and happened at the same time from a very, very young age. Um, I think probably as early as maybe four or four and a half, um, having discussions with, well, I guess you can't really have a discussion with a four-year-old, being talked at by my mother, um, about the dangers of and the realities of being brown in a predominantly um, white private school and the dangers of uh, older men regardless of race um, as a commentary I think bestowed onto me from her own inherited trauma and my family's own inherited trauma in dealing with um, sexual violence and that manifested itself in the form of lectures and talking about um, proper terms for anatomy, the difference between good touch and bad touch, which I think is something that a lot of people talk about but has somehow stuck with me um, and really colored a lot of the narratives not only amongst my family but amongst my peers and friends. Um, you know, this since we're in a sharing space, I'll share um, I have 
recently learned that a good friend of mine from high school, from middle school and high school, um, brought a case of incest to our high courts who found who there was a mistrial. Um, and this is the sixth person I know in my life at age 32, um, woman of color, who has been the victim of incest and has had their case thrown out. Um, so it's something that's always been very prevalent. And I guess one other thing I should add, which I should have mentioned and things that I'm doing is um, I'm co-chairing, and you're going to be on one of the panels, the um, TFAP Feminist Art Project CAA conference in February, where we are going to be talking about rape and representation from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, so, and it's free and open to the public. Yeah, so something I've been listening to or hearing a lot, and a lot of people have answers, and it makes sense, is this idea of intergenerational trauma when it comes to patriarchy and internalized patriarchy. <coughs> um, so I wanted to ask, how has sexual violence, abuse, um, the sexualization of ourselves, the patriarchy in general, given rise to intergenerational trauma within your lives? And has this specifically colored your work um, or the way that you see kind of the futures of women, and females, and femme identifying folks? I think it's interesting that you guys all are like, my mother my taught mother. me this. <laughs> like, my mother taught me to be careful. Um, I think for me, um, I'm not able to divorce the work that I do as a <coughs> visual activist or curator or educator from my real life. Um, they're so intertwined with each other that everything that has happened to me or everything that has happened to people I, who I care about has really inserted itself in, um, in a way that I cannot extract from my practice and I think you know I think for a lot of us who are creatives we could probably agree that doing what we do is sort of a compulsion because um, I know I would have been an investment banker if I wasn't so compelled to be a creative um, and it's with that the, the personal for me becomes the professional um, so that's sort of the lens that I gave that I look through for all of my work I um, I would say for me, um, thinking about <coughs> the things that I've been taught about my body and then making the decision at some point within, I guess, uh, maybe my sophomore or junior year of BFA, um, to teach myself things about my body and make my own decisions for how I want it to represent it and feel about it and just unlearn a lot of things that come with that intergenerational trauma that is meant to protect, hopefully, really often. Um, and so for me, speaking like I guess to the process of my work, for one, I'm new in like all of my <laughs> work, like all of my work that I feel most, that I relate to now. And so being able to even um, present my body in that way was a decision I was making about, one, um, firstly, I guess like thinking of thin, white, nude bodies that, specifically other femme bodies that are allowed to exist in an artscape in a way that is really fluid and without friction. And so then um, deciding to put my body in that context as a way of both, it's hard because I want to make that work that's kind of sovereign of um, resistance, but it's inherently like resisting something like recognizing that pain and like it's not so simple as like leaving it at the door it's like okay it's here let's talk about it and try to sort of dematerialize that thing but also just really leaning into a radical imagination and deciding like we don't actually have to do it this way <laughs> and that like we don't have to there's room for everybody like being like one of the major I feel um like practices of trying to make a sovereign space for marginalized identities is like we don't have to do it the way that it has been done and to trust that your imaginations and intentions and talents can be realized within a space that is completely your own um, 
And yeah, but I feel like I also work from that, like from the inside out thing where you recognize that you have an amount or a proximity to privilege in which you can use that to bring everybody else in and break those walls down or make them into something else. Um, and finding some kind of, uh, I, I, use, I say this often, and it's from uh, Black Women Artists from Black, for Black Lives Matter, from the show that, that happened at the, the New Museum. But just finding that intersection between grief and joy and working from there, basically, or finding that sweet spot in order to make work that's both nurturing and recognizes a experience and a grief that's really true, um, but not necessarily having that be the driving force of the way that you what you live in, basically. Unless someone else has something you would like to say, I think we'll open the floor to questions now. <coughs> deliberating your questions back there, ask them. Yeah. <laughs> you can ask us anything. <laughs> um, okay, I guess I do have a question. <laughs> um, my question is, and anyone can answer, um, I think one of the things I'm really interested in and I've been thinking about in the end of this year is like how generous people have been with me um, and in my practices and in general, but I'm curious about like I think there's this thing that takes place particularly, not, well, amongst women, but I feel I've experienced it amongst women of color or black women, where we internalize the consumption that there isn't enough for all of us, that there aren't enough seats or aren't enough fellowships, aren't enough dollars for all of us, because like in reality, people do make checklists, and they're like, oh, we would like one black woman. Um, but I'm curious about how you all, um, feel that that can change or like what sort of from an, an internal point of view how you feel that you either deal with it or feel like you try to work against it or break down that notion I don't know if that makes sense um, I feel like I was just thinking about this um, when we sat down because I'm like oh I wonder if anyone else works in my medium or I wonder like what do I have to like this is this and then I'm just like oh my god what are you doing <laughs> but um, I feel like there's a huge I don't know I feel like there's a lot like I feel like a very important thing in that realm of like un like feeling like everything is a shared resource that is like being run dry I see it in so many different spaces like in my work at the public I feel like I've literally been talking about this to people over and over again that when you ask for a raise you're not taking money out of your mm -hmm. boss's pocket mm -hmm. and it's this like there is <laughs> something about the nonprofit arts that everyone loves to feel like you are in relation to everyone else mm -hmm. and everything that you do any pleasure that you have is taking pleasure from someone else and so there is this really weird thing that you don't actually look out mm -hmm. and you are just like in the same place that you're really excited to engender a collaboration and excitement you are also then becoming in competition in all these mm -hmm. slight ways that actually add up to a lot and you're failing to do things like speak openly about your salary which will help other people who are coming after you or even other people in your like <coughs> Um, colleagues get what they deserve um, but I think it's a I think it's a struggle in so many ways because like even if you are informed of and I know I'm speaking to like a more institutional perspective um, but I think that it kind of does billow out even when you might be informed as to what you could be entitled to or what you're worth or that you want more resources the woman above you might not be informed and so she severs that before you actually get to the source and it's not from a place of hatred or of ill intent but it's from like well I hustled and I came up in this way you gotta hustle and come up in that same way and it's something that's been really difficult for me to accept and I won't but it's something that I see so much in people who I love and people who I see as mentors but that I'm finding like 
I don't understand why, why, why do I need yeah. to be upset? Why do I need to struggle? Okay, cool. But I think it's something that is really important to bring up amongst, like, when you're speaking to, like, black folks and POC folks and, like, black femmes in particular, is that I think we, at least in the circles that I've seen, I begin to feel like people are like, we're fucked enough. I don't understand why we're sitting here trying to be like, mm -hmm. don't, like, don't have that, don't have that. What happens is if you get that grant, then call on your black femme friends, and when you hire people, get your black femme friends a part of it too. Because at the end of the day, we are going to have to be the ones paying each other and watching each other's hustle. And I find that like, okay, if I get enough money, I'm not going to be without, but if I get more than I'm expecting, I'm going to make sure the person I hire is my friend. Um, is my friend who is a black femme, who I know like we're just trying to find the resources and then get them back to the people who we see need them as well. Well, I mean, I would just say that I mean, I think about this quite often, but just the entire idea of scarcity mm -hmm. is just, that's just like a line of however it plays out. And it can play out, I mean, it can play out just as artists versus the world. It can, you know, or it can play out with, you know, people of color within the art world versus white people in the art world. Or you can slice and dice this like so many different ways, and it's, it's always like a really fucked up uh, power dynamic. And it's just about making us, like I thought what you said was so very, it's like, do I have to be upset about this? Like, you know, it's about sort of engineering a kind of strife within all of us, I think, that we forget about um, taking care of one another and looking out for one another. And instead, <coughs> we go into survival mode. We go into, I just got to get mine, and I just got to, I'm sorry, I'm going to screw you over, but like, I got to take care of mine. I gotta me and my family and whatever. Um, but I think you see that played out in so many different ways over and over and over. I mean, that's capitalism. That's yeah. like, I mean, that's just like, it's all over. And it's, um, it's really, really, really awful. Um, but I think that like, you know, everyone has to deal with that. I don't know. I wish that we could really, if we could dispense with like one thing in this world, the idea that there's like only so much X to go around would be like the best thing for us all. But like we can start with that, and then I think a lot of the other problems that we have will sort of resolve themselves <laughs> from there. people's materials and mediums so would y'all like to share like maybe what 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 material excites you the most right now in your practice and what is drawing you to it uh, yeah so for me that's um, play and video and independently or together um, and that's because so basically non in my workbook, I use um, air hardening clay that is a red clay that kind of resembles flesh for me. And so I think of clay as this material that takes on any form, and it's both like a medium and kind of a finished product. And I think of my body in that same way. And so it's this material that translates into so many different forms and makes me think about my identity like I was saying earlier, as this thing that's an object but a subject and kind of the friction between those two ideas. Um, and then video I think of as um, this like performing for a camera and the history of like my identity behind a camera and in front of a camera. And a lot of my videos are just me like running between <laughs> the front of the camera and behind the camera to make sure everything's in place. But I think of it as this medium that can take on, again, like many forms, and just kind of encapsulate movement, <coughs> um, composition, and just has this kind of life force to it that is really easy, easily distributed and kind of democratic in that way. Um, 
And so when done right, a video can communicate very efficiently ideas and be distributed <coughs> in a way that is accessible. That's a really, really good question, and it's something I'm going to be thinking about more. Like, I, I don't feel like the, the answer that I'm giving you is actually the right answer, but it's an answer, and so I can just sort of put it out there and I can, we can all move on with our lives. Um, so I would say wool, because wool, well, that, that's all polyester and cotton, but wool is this incredible material that um, shrinks it, and you can purposely shrink it. You can leave it the way it is. It can take on like a whole bunch of different, really incredible characteristics. You can dye it very easily. You can mix it with other fibers. You can do all sorts of crazy things that are either sculptural or very painterly, depending on how you work with it. Um, and I just think it's fascinating, and I'm always fascinated by it. And yeah. Uh, but the larger question, or the larger answer that I'm going to be thinking about, is probably clothing. So I'm really, I've been thinking a lot about clothing, but I'm, I'm not ready to. <laughs> oh, um, uh, drawing, gouache, uh, chalk pastel, wet and dry together, um, using, using it intuitively and without any rules. Um, I sort of spent a long time working with rules and oil painting and turned away from that, and I think it let me feel free in my work, which um, opened up all of these possibilities. And, Makes me excited every day to draw and paint. So. What about you? <laughs> My answer is so ridiculous for me. Um, I love velvet and fur. I'm really, <laughs> I'm super tactile, and I found that I can't really go to dance class anymore without like velvet pants on. And then my cousin also, the sounds like. I am very much not like out here buying fur, but my cousin who I live with um, works in the fashion industry and whenever they're trying to throw out fur, she will take it and be like, okay, we'll just collect it. So right now our house has like, our apartment has like maybe like 10 big old like, just like swaths of fur. And we're trying to figure out, we're, we've just been looking at it every night being like, what do we do with it? <laughs> and then we just kind of end up like sitting and touching it while we're watching TV. Um, but I just love, I love tactile things, um, and I also just love, like, fabulous shit, so. <laughs> you don't know, you're not going to be a stop at all this time, right? <laughs> no, we'll see. <laughs> we'll hear from Jasmine. Oh, I got nothing. nothing. I'm a curator. I don't know. I like everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think, yeah. Yeah, we want to thank you guys for being so open and honest about all of your experiences. And thank you guys for coming and for listening so attentively. And we're just really, <clears throat> I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to both co-curate this with Lucy and at Fort Gans Award. Um, with, so thank you, Adam. <laughs> we will give applause to a man at this talk. Yeah. <laughs> But, oh, you want to say anything? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's included in the show, and then thank you so much to you guys for, for we wanted to get as many voices involved as possible, so we're glad we got some extra.